Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to you all uh, from wherever you are joining us uh, around the world. Uh, such is the nature of the virtual platform uh, that really we can be participating in conversations uh, from our different corners of the world. Welcome to this GPI Digital Salon on Women in Conflict and Peace Building. My name is Christine Mundua, and I will be moderating today's conversation. The GPI has brought us into discussion on the occasion of the June 19 UN International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict. Now, as you may already know, rape is increasingly being used as a weapon of war in places of conflict. Many of those conflicts are raging in the continent of my birth in Africa. And I want to now use this moment to introduce to you the speakers today, the people that you will be hearing from, as you will get to learn uh, in the course of our conversation, in the hour that we have together. They have been engaged in efforts to help end the violence. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce, first and foremost, Ambassador Christoph Heusken, who is Germany's permanent representative to the United Nations. It's good to see you. Good morning, I believe it is, there in New York. And then, of course, Ilwad Elman. She is the Director of Programs and Development at the Elman Peace Center. More on her uh, in a moment. But first, I'd like to invite uh, Ingrid Hamm of the GPI because she has a few words for us before we get our discussion underway. Ingrid, the floor is now yours. Just uh, unmute your microphone, please, uh, Ingrid, before we proceed. So now you can hear me. Uh, so, unlike Corona, violence against women cannot be stopped with a vaccine. Uh, Christine already mentioned that um, rape became a weapon of war, cheap and extremely effective because it does not only hurt the women, but destroys whole families and communities. To stop it needs sustained efforts by governments, by communities, by the civil society, and by brave individuals. Like her friend and brother in arms, novel laureate Dennis Mukwege, uh, Ilvat Elman went to the UN Security Council to witness and, advoc and advo ad advocate in this behalf. Women play a central role in conflict not only because they might become victims of terror, often they are the better negotiator, the better troubleshooter, and definitely the best peacekeeper. Women inclusion in peace building is essential for long-term success. We know not only at GBI that conflict the big destroyer of all development and peace makes a ground for growth. That's why we have to foster women. And that's why we have to act globally and in cooperation. That's why we need the UN so much today more maybe than ever. And a warm welcome also from our side to Ambassador Wolfgang Heusken. And we need women in government, role models like Mary Robinson, who was invited to this session, but unfortunately she got sick only two hours before <laughs> and we, uh, we know only since an hour that she cannot join us. You know, Mary Robinson, uh, the former Irish uh, president uh, is nowadays the chair of the elders and she was in before the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. But beside of all of that, she is the member of the selection committee of the Aurora Prize. And she is not only just a member, she is, I would call, the heart of the committee. Uh, I don't know who of you knows the Aurora Initiative. The Aurora Prize endowed with 1 million US dollars is called the Nobel Prize for Humanity. And the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative seeks to address on the ground humanitarian challenges around the whole world. 
It was founded by three Armenians, one of them the co-founder of Moderna, the vaccine pharma uh, firm some of you might know in between. Um, and it is rooted in the Armenian history, um, founded in behalf of the survivors of the Armenian genocide, celebrating the saviors, not the victims, the saviors, and uh, for sure, uh, Elvad is um, uh, one of them. So I'm looking forward to a very, very uh, vivid uh, conversation. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor to you back, Christine. Thank you so much uh, for that, Ingrid. Uh, yes, so we're talking today about women in conflicts and peace building. And we're gonna be laboring the point about why protection and participation are key. You've heard Ingrid uh, allude to that. And certainly, of course, that notice for those of you who are expecting uh, to hear from Her Excellency Mary Robinson, she has taken ill. And of course, our thoughts uh, go out to her at this time. We're wishing her a speedy recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to tell you that um, Ilwad is just 31 years old and already she has been described as having made a remarkable contribution towards positive change in her home country. And it's no surprise then, ladies and gentlemen, that she is the 2020 Aurora Prize Laureate. And we have a short video to tell you a little bit about her work and we'll pick up the conversation after that. So let's show our audience uh, this video about Edward and the work that she does and we'll start over from there. Ladies and gentlemen, the story there of Ilwad, uh, and uh, I would, I'd like you to put your your, your microphone, Ilwad, because I, I I I've read that you left Canada. You were just twenty years old. This is the country that you grew up in. You left at twenty to return to the country uh, of your birth, Somalia, to continue the work that your father had begun. Just give us a sense of where that conviction came from, Ilwad. Um, I always get quite emotional actually watching that video, um, but thank you very much for that kind introduction and first of all, good afternoon everyone, everyone that's joined us, distinguished colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here with you all for this very important conversation and I'd like to start by again passing my condolences to the family of Mr. Vartan, co-founder of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative who passed just over a month ago. And um, I'd also like to thank Ambassador, Ambassador Hoiskin for his strong advocacy for ending sexual violence and conflict during Germany's seat on Security Council. He has been such a staunch advocate and I wanted to personally acknowledge the importance of this kind of leadership in the Security Council moving forward when we see the treatment of women and the rampant sexual violence happening every day in areas like Tigray right now or other places. <clears throat> My, I, I left Somalia, I left Somalia when I was two. Um, like millions of others, I fled the country when it broke out into war. <clears throat> Spent a couple of years in the refugee route. And then finally my family got asylum in Canada. And it was actually at the age of 19 that I returned to Somalia. And my mother had, by that time, already returned to Somalia and set up the LNP Center in honor of 
my late father who is killed in Somalia for the work that he was doing so successfully in disarming and demobilizing and rehabilitating young people being co-opted by warlords at the time. So it's always been just my mom and my two sisters and I in Canada. She's always raised us to know that we have a responsibility and an opportunity that many people don't to grow up in the privilege of Canada, but that she will go back to Somalia one day. And as soon as my youngest sister, Iman, was in high school, she left. That was always her, her threshold. It was like the boogeyman. It was the story that we always heard growing up. When she goes to high school, I'm leaving. So it was my eldest sister um, who was killed in 2019 who actually raised us at, after that point. Um, I decided to move back to Somalia, one, just to understand what was compelling my mother to be there, to, to understand the conflict of my home that's not really my home because I had been away from so long and the only things that I saw depicted on me global media was just war and suffering and we lose contact with her for weeks at a time and as soon as I arrived to Somalia much of that was reaffirmed and I really did see what war looks like it was in my backyard but I also saw how many people needed her the same way that we needed her and at the young age of 19, I found purpose. I saw that an overwhelming majority, 80% of the population of the country are under the age of 30. In a country that's only ever known war. 30 years, they've only ever known war. And I saw that there was both appetite and interest and opportunity for some of the innovative ideas that I was uh, proposing. So, what was supposed to be a summer holiday turned into 11 years and um, I haven't left since. So those are my, my primary reasons for going. But to take your question further on why I stayed is how women and girls were being disproportionately affected by the conflict in Somalia. And that's not only just local women and girls, it also included women of privilege, like myself and my mother, constantly being berated, being threatened, being harassed for trying to create any sort of change. And then the question comes, if we that have such privilege to leave at any moment and go back to Canada are being challenged this way, imagine what life must be like for the widowed uh, woman or, or the elderly woman or for the young girl who's not going to school. And my motivations for staying were, were really charged by that, knowing that not everyone has the opportunity to leave. Thank you so much. And I think as, we, as we've listened to you there, you've really outlined for us what it is that, that motivates your family. Um, certainly your family has paid a high price uh, for, for the peace activism. Uh, that you all are engaged in. And it is just incredible to see uh, the strength through which you're pulling through and, and continuing with this work. Ambassador Hoiskin, I'd like to bring you into the conversation at this time. Ilwad, of course, went on to, to commend your strong advocacy at the level that you are working at. But Ilwad's done a very good job of giving us the picture as it is in Somalia, as she experienced it, as she continues to experience it. Can you just give us a, a bit of a, an overview of, of what it is like the challenges for women in conflict zones uh, and conflict areas as we speak. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Christine, and uh, thank you to um, Dr. Ham for, for having me here. Wonderful to see you again, uh, Ilvat. Um, what you just have, uh, what you just said about uh, your home country, Ilvat, what you just have said about uh, Somalia, um, unfortunately, we witness worldwide, um, and um, we have the, the a situation that in conflict um, there is um, sexual violence regularly, regularly um, used also as um, um, instrument of warfare. Um, you have that in in your country, Somalia. You have it. Um, 
in Tigray right now, you mentioned this, Edward. You we had this before in um, you know, in, in all of the conflicts from South Sudan to the DRC. Um, we have it in other country in other continents. Um, we um, um, witnessed this from um, Afghanistan um, to the Balkan Wars in the 90s in in the center of, of, of Europe. Um, and um, we have to we, we have to work um, on this. this. This is something that is unacceptable. Um, and we used our two years in the Security Council to um, raise um, really the to, to raise attention to to this. And uh, you, um, I think um, Dr. Ham um, mentioned it. We had um, the privilege to have Dr. Mukwege. Um, in the Security Council and tell the Security Council it was an open meeting, tell the world about um, what is happening in, um, in his country, in, in DRC, but worldwide, and uh, what he has been doing, what he's doing to um, actually help, um, help the victims. And we also had um, Nadia Murat in the Security Council, the Nobel Prize, both won the Nobel Prize, and Nadia Murat, um, who has herself been victim of sexual violence that um, during um, the um, Iraq um, war, during um, the ISIS uh, war that, the, um, that her, um, her family, her group, her ethnic um, and religious group of the Yazidi were confronted with uh, um, systematic um, sexual violence. And, uh, um, I think it's always when you have concrete cases, when you when you have the people there, that that people actually pay attention. And this meeting where we had, we also had Amal Clooney there as an advocate for um, for victims in the Security Council. And uh, um, this is um, when I look back to the two years, this was um, um, maybe. Um, I mean, highlight is is uh, maybe the wrong expression, but it was. Um, really the, the most important meeting we had. We were able at the time to adopt a, a resolution, um, so binding international law, um, which puts, um, which has um, uh, a victim-centered approach that the victims actually that, um, and what you can, you can um, confirm that, that victims of sexual violence um, um, you know, in many cases are, are isolated. They are not being really helped. They don't come out. They feel ashamed. Their family feels ashamed. And this is something totally unacceptable. And this is what we want to bring out. And of course, what is key um, for all crimes, uh, but also for, for this crime in particular, this is accountability, that um, the perpetrators have, be, have to be brought to justice. And this is something that we want to um, really um, um, wanted to and continue to want to 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 highlight and really make uh, make it um, make it possible and not only and see that it's really really done. Education is important. Um, um, societies have to understand that um, you know, young people and um, Ilbert mentioned the um, the the. Um, the demography of her country, which is the same in many countries, young people have to be educated and have been told that this is absolutely unacceptable um, um, what is being done, the use of sexual violence. So this was for us very important. We have um, continued, it was not a one-time event, we do it uh, regularly, we continue to work um, on the on the on the issue. Um, and um, I don't want to be too long. Um, the the um, this is, of course, kind of the phenomenon of, of societies um, uh, where women are being seen as the weaker ones, women are the uh, victims. What we need to do to change this is, of course, what I said, accountability, education, but we need, and this is also the subject of our debate today, Christine, and that is leadership. We have to get women in leadership positions. Um, um, it's easy for me to say because we are now in the 16th year in Germany of a woman at the helm of, um, of the German government. And it was a, was a great pleasure and honor for myself to, to work as a diplomatic advisor to the chancellor for 12 years and to witness the way that women conduct um, um, uh, policy. Um, in Africa, Iwat, um, I, I must say, um, um, 
it is still very sad. I think the only elected executive um, prime minister or president until today um, remains Ellen Johnson Sirloff. Um, there may be a couple of other, some presidents, uh, but who are not presidents with executive power. Um, we now have one in Tanzania, and um, um, I've not followed too closely, but um, we are, I think, Malawi, and, and uh, um, I think we need uh, women in, in leadership. Um, it is key. I have witnessed this. We have, um, and, and this has been proved. We have here, by the way, in, uh, in New York, we have um, Amina Mohamed, a, um, a Nigerian. Yes, yes. You, are, you are in uh, Abuja right now. We have the Deputy Secretary General here in New York, a very strong um, woman, and um, I'm very passionate about her. So we need leadership and we need to promote this. Um, actually, I'm the co-chair of a group of Friends of African Women Leadership Network, something that Germany is also supporting in Africa. And um, Ilvat, sorry to say this, but um, you have to go into politics and um, um, you know I think it would be it's about time you know I don't want to have any um, diplomatic um, complications there but in the country you are I think it would be good if one could some stage lower the average age of um, of leaders in in some of your countries so, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for that and you you provided a, a great segue really for for Ilwa to tell us a little bit more uh, about the work that you are doing with the Elman Peace Center which uh, is the first rape crisis center for survivors of sexual violence uh, and gender-based violence in Somalia tell us about the leadership uh, that you're providing in what uh, through this peace center as you help people Uh, you are muted, Edward. Just make sure to unmute your microphone. There yes. we go. Uh, well, first of all, very, thank you very much for those kind words, Ambassador. And hopefully when the, the age of participation or the, the, part, the process becomes democratic, I can join the leadership um, that I think the country, so, the country and the continent so desperately need. Over the past few decades, increasing attention has been paid to the role of women in peace and security as a result of strong women movements um, that we at the Ellen Peace Center have also been a part of. It's led to the adoption of the Security Council of Resolution 1325 and the subsequent resolutions. These resolutions have all been instrumental in demonstrating how women can and do actively participate in building peace in their communities across the globe. Without a doubt, much has been achieved because of 1325. But with the remaining significant challenges to participation that Ambassador just alluded to and inclusion of women in these processes worldwide, I worry that the resolution itself has become more romanticized than the actual quantifiable results of it. We know of the transformational potential of women as peace leaders. And there's a significant empirical evidence of sustained peace and higher success in rates of implementation a peace agreements when women are involved and are serving in leadership capacities. And for all of us in this room, it would be really preaching to the converted if I went on to list in all the ways in which women are fit for the job and should be sent to stage of peace and security. But there still is a disconnect that exists between the global norms we champion and the, the local realities of women peace builders. Um, Sorry, I want to just interrupt you there. Can you talk to us about those those barriers as as you um, perhaps have experienced them firsthand? I mean, just to give you an example of what's happening right now in Somalia, you know, we're supposed to be going through a political transition. The government that we currently have, its mandate ended February eighth. All these years, 20 years of championing 1325, the inclusion of women in peace and security, every time that we have a chance to actually implement these resolutions that we celebrate, to actually bring young people, women at the table to negotiate a way forward, to de-escalate armed conflict, the patriarchy always rears its ugly head again, and then we go to the fastest way out of conflict. And in Somalia, what we saw was the was that, you know, the president wanted to extend his term and there was political violence, there was there were protests, people were shot, 
there were fatalities. And at the negotiation table, it was the same five men making decisions for the overwhelming majority of the population, which are youth and women. And it's, it's disappointing that, you know, we keep celebrating these global resolutions, but whenever we have a chance to implement them, the international community remains extremely reserved. We saw these tensions building and access to information, access to participation, all of these things are where we look to our international partners to really open doors for civil society. We want a Somali-led process. We don't want to be dictated and told what to do, but in order for a whole of society approach, there needs to be someone that opens doors. And um, this particularly affects young women, young women peace leaders disproportionately, because right. even culturally, as you can probably relate to Christine, in Africa, when there are distinguished, you know, older, um, veteran, iconic women leaders in a room, young women peace leaders don't have a voice. And uh, these are systems that we need to change. And it, the only way that we can change them is through a legal framework. Our, constitutional, our constitution remains provisional till this day, yet we keep referencing it to allow atrocities to happen. Ilwad, that really brings me, the, the point you're making uh, really uh, addresses to an extent a question that's come in from Helena in the audience. And, and by the way, I want to encourage uh, our members of the, in the audience to please use the Q&A forum uh, to submit questions. Uh, Ilwad, Helena is asking you to just to expand a little bit. She's got a very specific question um, about the recommendation that you could offer a country like Germany, for example, um, to, to what concrete actions would you like to see uh, from a government like Germany? While you're having a, a think at that, Ambassador, I wanna bring you into the conversation because um, the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, um, when, when the UN uh, adopted, of course, that, um, that resolution sponsored by, by Germany to combat sexual violence in conflict uh, and, and strengthening of victims, women, of course, being among them, Minister Ma said that the adoption of that resolution, which is number 2467, was a milestone uh, on the path towards putting an end to sexual violence uh, in conflict. Tell us how so. Um, and there is this, this aspect to the resolution about holding the perpetrators to account. If you could speak to that resolution as well, but mostly on the part of strengthening the victims, which is what people like Inward are calling for, that you've got victims who, who don't want to be known as victims, who want to to have a stake and, and participate in the peace building, but they're continuously being sidelined. Just talk to us about that effort and Ilwad, I'll come to you uh, on, on the uh, answer to Helena's question. So Ambassador, the floor is yours now. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I mean, what um, Foreign Minister Ma said, of course, is, is key. And um, what we can do here at the UN um, is to um, set the principles, to set the norms, um, to raise attention, um, but then it has to be implemented. It has to be implemented um, on the ground in conflict. And um, um, what we see, of course, and uh, um, I will not paint a, a bright picture here, what we see is that despite of um, um, the, the, the normative framework that we have set, sexual violence um, continues to, to, to happen. Um, so um, um, what we need to do is to remind again and again on a global level, but then in individual countries, um, again, in light of the obligation of governments um, to implement um, 2467. Um, it does happen on occasions. Um, there is, for instance, in, in uh, South Sudan, there was um, you know, kind of transitional justice. Um, we know about justice in, um, in Colombia um, after conflicts. Uh, there are examples. Um, we are um, working very hard also in the country where Nadia Murat um, uh, comes from in, in, in Iraq. Um, so we, we promote this. I think we as Germany and also other countries have to um, um, support um, regional and in, in particular national and local um, initiatives to, to implement it. Um, and this is something that we, as I said, we, we have to do um, again and again. 
um, uh, because the reality is as, as it is. Um, what is um, important, and I come back to, to what I said before, and Ilva just said about um, Somalia, the fact that, um, what do you say, five men around the table decide about the fate of a nation, the fight about, you know, do they have elections or not, and uh, the, the, the conferences. This has to stop. We have to, um, just as we um, have as a, as a rule here, um, you know, there is in, in, in our house here, there is no panel possible without a woman. There must not be any peace negotiation without a, a, a woman. When I, when I look at peace negotiations, for instance, in Afghanistan, where um, the Taliban don't have one woman there, I mean, this doesn't augur well what is happening there. So I think we, we just need to um, have this um, um, implemented, we have to raise it, we have also on political talks um, in, in, in um, political talks in, in, on big summits, um, it has to be on the agenda, people have to be motivated, we actually have to go to quota systems um, that um, um, we, we implement, um, uh, not only in parliaments, we have to do it in business, we have to do it um, you know, whenever it comes to negotiation, we have to be much more consequential. We just have to to do this, and this is something you can you can um, um, say here in New York. But um, the implementation then is on 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 local level. So we need right. champions. We need somebody like like Ilvat um, in in Somalia or in um, right. um, Nigeria. But what you need, last point, is then that you need in the political system. You need somebody like Ellen Sirloff Johnson, you need these people who then actually made, this is why I mentioned before, and but I, I would like to see if, if what you think about it, because I have a meeting today with you and women on it, on the African Women Leaders Network, that we boost this and, and uh, that there is this grassroots, um, uh, kind of grassroots um, initiative also pushed from New York, where we change this. Mm. Sorry, Christine. It's interesting you were saying that, Ambassador, because you are saying all of the right things. But I, I, I want to just you know put myself in, in the shoes of Ilwad here for a second. All the work that she's doing, um, and she needs more support than than words. Uh, she needs more support than to be told that you know resolutions have have been made and, and, and implementation is 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 the challenge. These five men at the table, uh, who can really be in, in any country on the continent of Africa, really um, continue to get the backing and the support and the endorsement. From institutions like the United Nations, and this is why things don't change on the ground. Because, as Edward said, we, we see these peace uh, treaty signed, and we in the media show the pictures of men in suits gathered around who've delivered the peace. Yet, the women who are so instrumental, the it, women like Edward, really get the the attention and and and, and the support that they require. So, Edward, come in on the um, question that Helena has asked there. I'd like to ask Ambassador to then, of course, respond to you uh, uh, upon your recommendations. So, Edward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine and uh, Helena, for both the kind words in uh, the chat function and the questions. You know, everyone caught living under the conditions of armed conflict suffers, but that suffering is spread unevenly. The fact is, in general, that women and girls suffer significantly worse, but that doesn't mean that women's ability and their identity should be reduced to victimhood or beneficiaries only. If anything, it should further propel them to be recognized first and foremost as the actors and agents of change and be the ones that are involved in developing the legal frameworks that protect their interests, rights, and well-being. So for practical recommendations to Germany and the broader international community is that you must recognize and address unreservedly without fear of PNGs or, you know, government cutting ties, the harmful patriarchal attitudes that have an impact on the rights, integrity, and agency of women when they see it, while creating ways for local actors to also be involved in these conversations. It is critical for you to, to invest in women's capacity, their agency, and leadership through substantial funding support, network building, capacity strengthening, recognizing the full diversity of women in the space and the ways they organize. Not everyone is a politician. Some people are thought leaders. Some people are artists. People can play different roles in creating systems of peace. But training and network building and coalition building is significantly important for this. And I feel the biggest failure, not only for Somalia, but in many places where 
the international community where Germany definitely has spent an, an, an amount an, an unamountable an accountable amount of resources to try to help move democracy forward is that only invested in institutions primarily in governments in systems building rightfully so but without the parallel investment in civil society in organizations in people's movements because i believe if that had been done at the same time we would not be facing the political stalemate and the conflict and and the threat of the hard-won gains over the last decade being lost in just a minute because we we, we would have had a people that would have held their their governments and their accountable throughout the process, not just at the end. The systems that reinforce exclusion have to be transformed in order to address structural barriers that actually limit women's participation and peace and security. So I really do agree with the ambassador about the need for quotas. And people have differing views about quotas. Some are for them, some are against them, but to me, they are the foot in the door. They are the initial surge in which women can participate meaningfully in political processes. In 2016, there was um, there, there was a big push for the 30% quota for women. And the international community stood behind the women's movement because we're still not, we're still not a democratic country. We're still you know, under this 4.5 tribal based power sharing model where even women candidates still have to go under men and get elected by the male um tribe leader so but because each male elder was saying that we're not going to have a woman represent us it was actually made conditional that they choose the women first before they choose the men this time around we're just trying to de-escalate de any kind of conflict. No one wants to lose the hard-won gains that we've made over the last 10 years. So there are no real strong pushes for women's involvement or the 30% quota as we saw in 2016, which is a really big missed opportunity. And I think that this is something that we need to continue to push for. I think that, yeah, just, just to close on a recommendation really and to kind of emphasize the point that i already made you need to have a dual track investment in developing countries not just with institutions but also in people's movements in coalition building in civic participation and education capacity building because then whatever government comes into place now on somalia we can hold them account throughout the four-year term so Ambassador, on that note, I'd like to, to, to ask you to, to come back uh, on that, specifically on the issue of investments. Um, is, is, is what Ilwad is recommending plausible? Is that something that could be done? Um, I think what, what Ilwad said, um, how things should happen um, is absolutely the, the right way. Um, what is, what is the, the challenge? Um, you know, from, from my perspective, sitting here in New York, um, you sit in the Security Council, you set the norms, you, you, you try, um, for instance, by inviting um, women briefers to the Security Council, by allowing civil society to participate, uh, to get, um, uh, like Nadia Murat, you know, to, to expose uh, then the ambassadors or foreign ministers uh, to this issue. Um, what we cannot do here from New York, of course, is then implement this in um, on a national level um, and um, there um, you are confronted um, with um, um, the notion which we all adhere to of sovereignty there's the sovereignty of a nation the sovereignty of an elected government and when you come there um, germany for instance has these political foundations so we come with our um, you know development cooperation um, you are all you you have your ideas and germany is promoting um, and if i said that you know women participation etc but you are at the mercy of course of the local government and um, 
if you have then um, um, a government where you have um, you know males all over the place, I mean the, the the chance to get in there is 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 difficult. What I think, and and then of course you when you come as you know uh, the white Europeans to 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 Africa, you know you are very easily um, criticized as paternalistic or neo-colonialism, etc. Um, which we are confronted here, even in the Security Council, sometimes when we, right. when we, when we, we make. So it has to be. Um, it has to be. You have to have the local support. I think it's very important that also in Africa, when we talk about uh, um, your continent, Ilwat, that the African African Union uh, promotes the the regional organizations promote it. But we are still very very much behind. Um, now um, I think we should be. Um, um, you know, I'm not a practitioner on the ground, but maybe we, as as donors, and Germany, by the way, is the second largest donor to the overall UN system. Maybe we have to condition much more. We have to condition our our support. Um, one thing, let me say this, which is going back to New York. Um, unfortunately, on um, the implementation of 1325, on the implementation of this. Um, groundbreaking resolution for gender um, um, gender balance and promotion of, of women's rights, et cetera. We have a pushback today. We have a very strong pushback um, on by, by Russia. Um, Russia has a very 19th century approach to, to the role of women and by China. Um, China, the same thing. Um, you know, they have um, promotion of civil society, promotion of, of women's rights. Others, we see this left and right. How difficult it is to get this to get this through. So even on the on on the level here, right now we were thinking on the 20th anniversary of 1325. You know, um, we we were thinking of can we strengthen this? At this stage, uh, we are happy if we can keep the the key, if we can keep what what has been achieved in the past. So. There is some pushback, and um, so so we have to work here in New York, but we have to work on the on the local level. This is why you know what I said earlier: the African Women Leaders Network um, is something that we have to promote. There are many um, um, initiatives of also on a um, with young women, um, um, but we have to see that these initiatives then are actually um, you know transferred into. Um, um, you know, influence on on power, on the structures, um, getting women into into there. It's it's not enough just to have meetings where you proclaim what you want, but it has to happen. And um, there, um, as I said earlier, you know, we have to see how um, you know from the outside we can we can push this more and condition it more. I think with all the development aid that uh, that um, you know is going into so many countries. We have to condition it more that um, institution building um, uh, you know, there, there there has to be um, stronger participation of civil society. The um, um, you know, what what happens, for instance, you know, with military coups in Mali and 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 etc. This is unacceptable. You know, we we have to push more for civil society to 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 play a more important um, a role and win. If I can, do you want to come in there? Go ahead. Yeah, please, I can respond. Um, Ambassador, I think that you, you, you may underestimate the value of having civil society actually at New York, at the Security Council. I briefed the Security Council in 2015 at the first um, open debate on the protection of civilians. And it was the first time the agenda was also focused on women, peace, and security. And it came at a time when there was rampant sexual exploitation and abuse by African Union peacekeeping troops in Somalia against women and girls from the IDP communities. When I returned home, obviously that came with a lot of challenges, but it was after that intervention that we saw a gender um, officer and a focal point actually being appointed. So having civil society in New York at the Security Council, it is really important because sometimes the influence that we have in our countries is raised when we are in New York, when we are next to ambassadors and we are the Security Council and they hear us because you, you hear us. Um, I also wanted to mention that I think that we need to 
stop trying to make the old systems work. Stop trying to romanticize or continuously celebrate historical documents that once were historical and innovative and necessary at the time that created entry points to lead us to where we are now, but to also reimagine the future. Because clearly, peace negotiations, mediations, interventions are not reflective of the times that we're in today. Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, they're not coming to the negotiation table. Peace agreements in Colombia don't last longer than seven years, for example. We have so many examples of how the, this proverbial peace agreement table is just the first step of a process that needs to take much longer, 20 years. And I'm proud to be a commissioner of an initiative called the Principle for Peace, which is a two-year project where we are actually doing research and consultations and um, you know, really reviewing what's worked in the past and where we failed in the past and putting together the new standards for peace. And this will be under a report that will be published in, um, in, uh, in two years, in 2022. It's called the Principles for Peace. And I'm soon gonna be leading the global youth consultations and um, would love to connect with, with, with everyone here on the call to make sure that it really is representative because just as we saw most recently in this last summer during all of the Black Lives Matters protests, for example, in the US, there are resolutions for youth, but it's always a global north to global south process and, and documents. They don't even see these, these tools with, with the UN even headquartered in New York, they don't see these tools and these resolutions for peace building and resolving police violence as relevant to them. So there's a lot that we can change. And um, I think that there is a big disconnect between what's happening at the national level and what's happening in New York. So the platform that you mentioned, like the African Women's Leadership Network, it's very important. We actually co-hosted an event together, Ambassador, where we spotlighted women at the forefront of peace building with AWLN. And I think initiatives like that need to get more support because they actually take the global to the local. And um, I, I don't think you should underestimate it at all. I am I'm a proud member and I know a lot of women like me look to platforms like that for information that we can't get otherwise. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, as, as we've been having this conversation, um, I've, I've been thinking about in what uh, some of the, the points that, that Ambassador made about the context of, of where we come from, indeed our cultural norms. Um, when the men are talking, the, the women are silent, right? These are cultural things. Uh, this, elements of our society that, of course, have led to an environment where women continue uh, to face inequities. We're denied access to education in some families, and a lot of families, um, people invest in the education of a male child and, 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 and not a female child. And so that, that girl child is not able to compete uh, with her male counterparts to an extent because of that exclusion that often takes place very early on in our lives, Edward. And what is it that that we as young people ought to be doing um, in our countries to change this. I'm, I'm thinking about the demographics you talked about. Indeed, 77% of the African continent is below the age of 35 in what we, you and I are in this demographic. Um, I am from Zimbabwe, right in the South, and I can tell you we're experiencing similar challenges. Uh, the generations between those in power and, and, and those with the masses. What could we be doing? Um, and of course, then Ambassador Hoiskan's listening, and I know he's got a pen and paper, and he's taking notes about how he can support that. But I want to get your sense of what we could be doing uh, to, 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 to shift the, the mindset and attitude uh, that, that is creating this, this space where women are excluded. Well, you know what? Um, I think that's a fascinating question. And I'm very happy you asked that, because even in a high level forum with an ambassador present, in a conversation like this, we often take away our own agency and our own power 
and on what we can do without support, without funding, or without even being a traditional organization. I think that cooperation um, between young people across the continent is part and parcel. I think mentorship, I think um, sharing ideas. I think that there's so many ways that the private sector can be engaged as well too. We're living in an era now more than ever where brands and companies really want to be involved in good. And whether it's for demonstrating that they are you know, doing the right things for corporate social responsib responsibility, or if it's true, we can leverage that. And I think that this space needs to broaden up. It doesn't have to be only diplomats or activists, but it could be anyone, anywhere, using their voice to amplify messages of shared values. And um, I think that, I think, I may, I may be oversimplifying it just because I've been working in this field for, for so many years, but more often than not, young people believe that they have to start their own initiative in order to be able to create the changes they want to see in their community. But within my organization and the organizations that I cooperate with or exchange with or you know, informally work with, most of them are keen to provide opportunities to other young people instead of duplicating efforts or reinventing the wheel. So I would say, join an initiative, do your research, reach out and start. That's right. That's the, that's the hardest part to actually just start. And when you get the ball rolling often, that's, that's when we need push from allies and champions like the ambassador, like teams like GPI, and we can look for external support, but it really does have to start with us. That's right, it really does. And we're drawing to the close of our conversation and I wanna give the both of you a task. And that is, I want you to think about what your three takeaways uh, for our audience would be today. Just three things that you would like the audience to walk away with today. And, and as you're having a think about that, I'll just remind our audience that we have been discussing women in, in, in conflicts and peace building, why protection and participation are key. And I think as you've been listening to the conversation, you can see why there is a need to, to both protect women and then to create a space where they can participate formally because they are doing, they are active in peace processes, in, in, in conflicts that are raging on the continent and indeed in, in post-conflict uh, societies as well. But very much at an informal level, we had a statistic that I think Ingrid brought up in the beginning that by the time a peace treaty is signed, at some stage less than 4% of those signatures on these peace treaties were that of women. Yet in, in societies like African societies, women make up half uh, of, of, of a particular community. And so the idea that you're excluding half of, of society uh, in a particular uh, engagement um, is, 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 is alarming and that it's still happening to that extent today. There was a question that came through um, from Jacqueline and Jacqueline, I, I do believe that question was answered to an extent because Jacqueline has been talking about uh, the fact that, you know, women are involved in the peace process informally and she would like to get a good sense of how, how, how international organizations can, can help support women so that they get a stronger voice uh, on a national level. So perhaps Ilwad and Ambassador Hoiskan, as you, as you prepare your, your final three takeaways for our audience today, you might wanna accommodate that question again and sum it all up for Jacqueline. But thank you so much to everybody who's, who's been here for this conversation. We all have a lot to think about. And perhaps Ilwad as well, you know, you talked about the fact that in, in, in parts of the continent, in Somalia, indeed, we had issues with peacekeepers, the people who were supposed to be protecting people. We've heard accounts, I've, I've heard women in, in conflict areas talk about men in uniform did this to us, or men in part uniform did this to us. Um, it makes a difference to see another woman there uh, for other women, especially women in, in, who find themselves um, in, in these areas when they're able to relate their experience to another woman this is what has happened to me. We need to record these accounts. Women feel safer opening up to other women so that we can bring perpetrators to account. We cannot do that if we don't have the accounts of that. So the role of women is absolutely key. 
And at this juncture, I will perhaps start with you, Ambassador, with your three takeaways um, as to what you would like the audience to walk away with. And maybe you, you want to ask us how we can support your work as well, uh, Ambassador. What could we be doing uh, at the grassroots to make your job easier at the top, at, at UN level? Uh, so over to you, Ambassador, and then to you, Edward. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a, a, a very inspiring um, conversation and to, to listen to you, Christine, and, and also to Ilwat, you know, I, I um, sometimes, you know, when, when you sit in the Security Council or when you sit at the UN and you see how difficult it is, as I said earlier, you encounter a lot of pushback against what you um, think is the right thing, what you try to promote, to, to have you here to, to listen and, and see your enthusiasm, this is really encouraging. So, so thank you for including it. No, um, what are the three takeaways? Um, um, I'm going to steal this from, from Ilvat, um, the first one, and that is this starts with us personally, with each and every of us. No, um, we have to see when we come into a meeting um, that there are not only men around the table, but that we have uh, a woman. It starts with that at the family table. Um, you know, um, there are um, you know, so many um, uh, families where um, maybe there is, um, um, the, the parents are very conservative and, and the family is, and, and uh, um, just to, to bring it at the family table and, and uh, explain it and then um, what, what you stand for, empower um, the mothers who are very often um, kind of um, resignated in the, you know, with, with the situation in, in society and uh, tell them, well, this, you don't need to accept that. Um, um, there, by the way, the one, one issue we haven't um, discussed yet, a touchy one, is also the, the role of, of religion and uh, um, the need that, um, uh, or, or what the phenomenon is that sometimes uh, religion is misused um, to actually um, um, then um, see to it that um, um, existing structures are preserved and uh, not that this is something where um, um, you know you have now um, you know, uh, women and girls um, uh, be promoted also by these institutions. Um, when I look back in, into my career with um, um, where I worked with Chancellor Merkel, um, one of the outstanding, uh, the, the fantastic thing was was visiting classrooms, visiting classrooms in Mazar Sharif in the north of Afghanistan, where after the Taliban rule, where German troops are stationed uh, in the north, where um, uh, with our support with Afghan civil society, you had now classrooms filled with um, um, uh, girls and, and women being educated, women playing a more important role. And uh, we have now, for instance, a young um, Afghan woman as an ambassador of Afghanistan here. And we have to do everything to, to, to preserve this. Um, coming then again to, to the second takeaway, it's remi it remains an obligation of international organizations, of governments, um, also to, to see to it that what we had decided uh, here, what the norms that are decided, that they are actually actually implemented. So it's, it's on the, you know, the individual. Um, uh, we have to do it at the international level. Um, so we, we always have to see when things come up that we raise our voice, that we bring it to the table in the Security Council, that we have briefers. Eva, thanks for encouraging us. Um, there are cases, though, where briefers ca coming back, they are, they are kind of heroes, but we also have instances where there are reprisals. And uh, um, even where, when uh, we had a case where somebody couldn't go back to, it, oh, to her own country because she was criticized heavily. So obligation of the individual, obligation of governments, international organizations. And then the, the third one is the networking. And, and Ilvat, um, uh, thanks for supporting this. Um, we have to inspire in Africa, the African Women Leaders Network and, and have this on, on leaders, but also on younger networks that you can learn from each other where you were successful, um, what are the means to get into um, the positions where you can, you can actually work for, for, for change. So thank you very much for, for having me here. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Edward, over to you. Well, actually, maybe just exactly on that last point then, on networking as well too, that the Ambassador mentioned 
allow me to just maybe shamelessly plug why I'm even here in Abuja, in Nigeria, and to also maybe end this conference on a little bit of a higher positive note. We constantly talk about women, you know, being systematically not involved in high level processes. But recently, we at the LNP Center, a women led organization, a youth led organization from a protra protracted conflict like Somalia, whose community based inclusive reintegration work with groups that are designated as terrorists has been deemed as a best practice, has been now invited to come as an expert to the Lake Chad Basin region and lead the formation of a civil society network on the inclusive reintegration of community-based um, actors. And we brought together 32 organizations. And on the 24th of June at 11 a.m. West African time, we're launching the initiative. And I think that this is something to get behind because what you're seeing here is everything that we're talking about, women's leadership, youth leadership, local expertise, bridging global resolutions, and also unearthing indigenous, traditional, local best practices for inclusive reintegration. So if you want to support some positive developments, I think that these are the things to participate in. Um, and invites will be sent out um, for you all to join Tony if you can. Um, but this is, I think, at least, you know, an involvement. We, we are making progress. And this is in partnership with UNDP. And I'm really grateful for our, their support and trust in, in our organization and in my capacity as a young woman at the helms of this as well, too, in partnership with the local organization called the Neem Foundation. Secondly, for recommendations, for the donor community that's assembled here today, I want you to adopt and support the use of quotas for the direct and gender equitable participation of women, including young women in all phases of formal peace and political transition processes, from pre-negotiation to implementation, including national dialogues, constitution making, transitional justice, and all other political related peace and security processes, not just the 30% for women in parliament and make this a fundamental priority and not an optional second. Make your financial commitments to governments conditional to this if you're really serious about this agenda and don't be afraid and hide behind the multilateral system. We need individual allies and governments to stand up and to actually make these calls. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I know this is the beginning of a conversation we've been having for my whole life. Um, and we're gonna continue to have it, but there is progress. And I think everyone in this room can see that there is progress that's being made, but we have so much more work to do. So thank you very much for having me here today. That is absolutely right. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for affording us uh, six more minutes of your time that you had committed to spending with us. But thank you so much to our audience, those of you who've taken part, and of course, uh, to my panelists today. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hoiskan uh, and, and Elwood. And I think, Ambassador, you're taking away from us uh, that we're saying, we, we acknowledge that you face backlash uh, in, in doing what you're trying to do, but you have our endorsement as young people on the African continent continue to press our leaders because you have our support. Uh, and there it is, of course, coming through from Elwa Dizal. And Elwa, you are a shining star uh, for the rest of us. Continue in the work that you're doing. We acknowledge the loss and suffering uh, that you have personally experienced. Uh, it is admirable to see you continuing in the fight. Uh, you also have our support. I look forward to interviewing a President Alman uh, in my career. So you keep at it. Uh, and thank you so much again, ladies and gentlemen, for having taken part uh, in this. Of course, that conversation will continue. Keep watching the GPI. We will continue to bring you these conversations. Um, at some point, of course, we will make the recording of this event available. Perhaps you want to sit back and listen to, uh, to this again. We will definitely make sure that that is available. So for myself and the GPI team, thank you so much for, for this afternoon at this time or morning that you spent with us. And we hope to be seeing you soon. Uh, go well, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 My pleasure.